It was so obvious, so right there. It was in my face, your face, most faces. I was commanded by them, I obeyed. Suggestions that they made, I did. Every aspect of my life, they controlled me, bending me to their will as a non-resistant subject. I, alone with others, were helpless to stay their power, feeding their unexplained dominance over my life and others. I knew not my captors, at least I thought. Then they revealed themselves to me. They called themselves words. Upon realizing their identities, I started to study them. I learned that there were good words, bad words, words of indifference, words of praise, words that would inspire myself and others, words that could commit someone to shame. They had that power, and I saw that. Words, words that become ideas, I awaken. Words, words that become ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, TEDx Gary. Um, my name is uh, Jim Harper. I'm an attorney. I'm a criminal defense attorney. And a few years ago, I was representing a client, um, and that client had been convicted of a very serious crime. He'd been convicted of murder. And at the sentencing hearing, um, my client uh, was present, uh, and uh, the victim's family was present too. In fact, the mom of the, of the, the gentleman who'd been killed was present. And at, at the hearing, um, as happens at, at hearings like this, the victim's um, family, including his mom, had the opportunity uh, to say a few words to the judge, uh, say a few words, uh, the prosecutor say a few words uh, to the defendant. We give the victim that right. But she also had a question. She had a question for my client. She asked my client, I just want one thing for closure. Why did you do it? What was going through your mind? Why did this happen? And what the judge said to her, was that that wasn't an appropriate question, that that wasn't what this hearing was for. And strictly speaking, in our legal system, the judge was right. You know, we have what's called an adversarial system of justice in this country. You've got the state or the prosecutor or the government on one side, and you've got the um, defendant on the other side. But in this circumstance, in a lot of circumstances, that really stopped the victim's family from getting the closure that they were looking for. Um, and so there's another way to think about this, and there's another model uh, that's becoming increasingly popular around the world and in some places in the United States. Um, it's called uh, restorative justice, and that's what I want to talk about today. Restorative justice is a community-centered, non-punitive approach um, to preventing and addressing harms and addressing violations of legal rights. And I think it provides us with a really powerful model um, for thinking, what, thinking about what I believe is one of the big challenges we face in our country today, um, which is mass incarceration, and also what's called the school to, prison pop, uh, school to prison pipeline that I want to talk about a little bit tonight. I'm going to start by saying my first thing is I didn't get the, McKenna's very good for deadlines, I didn't get the memo about making your um, uh, slides vertical, so I apologize if they're a little, a little bit squished, but we'll do our best here. Um, so, as many people know, the United States, we've got an incarceration problem. That's something we've been talking a lot about um, recently. And I just have a few slides here that kind of highlight that. Um, the United States is about 5% of the world's population, yet 20% of the world's inmates are in the United States right now. One in five people around the world who is incarcerated at this moment is in the United States of America. Nearly 1% of Americans, and in fact 1% of working age Americans, is currently incarcerated in this country. And it's not just incarceration. So, of course, we've got the millions of people in this country who are incarcerated. We have millions more who are formerly incarcerated. We have many, many millions more, 19 million, who are felons in this country right now and have that stigma to carry around with them. 77 million have a criminal record, and even more have family members who are in jail. In Indiana, we don't fare um, much better. In fact, we have a slightly higher incarceration rate than the national average. 
You can see Indiana compared to the United States right there. We're just a little bit ahead when it comes to incarceration. And we are head and shoulders ahead of many other first world um, uh, countries. Now, we also need to talk about the fact that our criminal justice system um, is riven with disparity, with systemic racism that we need to work to overcome. So for instance, I think this is a helpful chart on that front. About 13% of the population in the United States are black Americans. Yet black Americans make up about 40% of people who are currently incarcerated. In fact, even though um, there are about four to five times as many white Americans, more black Americans, or approximately the same number of black Americans, are currently incarcerated. It tells me that we have a broken criminal justice system and that we need to look for some reforms to change this. Indiana is not much different. Um, the incarceration rate uh, for black Hoosiers is substantially higher um, than it is um, for white and Hispanic Hoosiers. And this, uh, this graph kind of um, uh, displays that. A lot of reasons for this. A lot of things that we need to work um, to tackle. But one that's been getting increased attention is what's called the school to prison pipeline. So it's this idea that it's not just the, the um, criminal policies or the sentencing guidelines that we have um, in Indiana and at the federal level that determine how many people are in jail. Policies from when children are very, very young can start to set the tone on what's going to happen later in somebody's life. So the ACLU, um, I'm a criminal defense attorney, so I said the ACLU. The ACLU um, has described the school to prison pipeline as a disturbing national trend wherein children are funneled out of our public schools and into the juvenile and criminal justice system. And they've identified five factors that really contribute to the school to prison pipeline. And I'm going to talk about a few of them. Zero tolerance policies in our schools, which are increasing, and I'll really focus on. Um, police presence in school hallways, there's been increasing conversation. Um, about the use of school resource officers in our schools and when that is and is not appropriate. Uh, disciplinary alternative schools, juvenile court involvement, and juvenile detention. Um, we know that many of these factors make it more likely that people are going to be involved in the criminal justice system if they have these earlier involvements. Um, the school prison pipeline has really gotten worse in the last 20 to 30 years with this idea called zero tolerance. I'm sure we've all heard about it. It's a tagline. That has led, and this is where my uh, uh, bad dimensions on the, on the slide uh, made, this, made this a little bit difficult, but I'll talk through it. That has led to disparities um, on race in school discipline. I'm sure it's something we've all heard about and thought about, but when you look at the numbers on the disparities in school dis discipline, it's really striking. It tells me we've got to do better. So for instance, if this were a little bit clearer, what you could see is that black Americans make up about, or school children make up about 16% of school children in this country. But they are dramatically overrepresented when it comes to suspensions and expulsions. In fact, when it comes to suspensions, nearly two to, or at least two, nearly three times um, overrepresented on that metric um, in the school population. Also when it comes, in this, that what this slide represents, when it comes to referrals to the criminal justice system or school-related arrests, black children are disproportionately um, more likely to be subject to those um, actions in our schools. And this one really gets me, and I wish that it was a little bit more legible, um, but preschool suspension rates. Now, I gotta say, I don't have young children, but it blew my mind when I found out that there were enough preschool suspensions in this country that we were connect collecting statistics on. But there are, and it's a thing that happens. And the disparities in our um, uh, school um, discipline policies really show themselves there. So at the preschool level, um, I believe that number is around 16% um, uh, black, black student enrollment. Um, Out-of-school suspension rates, 48% of out-of-school suspensions in this country um, uh, are, are, are black pre preschool students are um, black students. It tells us that we have a lot of work to do there. Um, this graphic um, uh, just is another one that I'm going to go through, but that highlights um, the school to prison pipeline and how it is particularly um, discriminatory. There's clear evidence, though, that if children have interactions with the criminal justice system early on or have exclusionary discipline, things like suspensions early on, they are going to be more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system as an adult. So it tells us that we really need to focus on earlier interventions. And one of the ideas that is really exciting to me is restorative justice. And in the educational context, it's referred to as restorative practices. And so some of the um, principles are laid out in this slide, but the general idea um, is that we get away from kind of a punitive model and towards a community-based um, based rehabilitative model. So three kind of general principles that when we talk about restorative practices in education, we're going to focus on. 
The first is the need to address the fact that a lot of kids come into school with trauma, right? And with a lot of other shortcomings and issues and challenges that they have. So schools that are really embracing restorative models work to overcome that on the front end to attempt to prevent um, uh, misbehavior or harm or whatever it may be. The second is that within the schools, we need to build community. So the people that we're going to school with, if we have strong community bonds with them, we're let, those bonds are less likely to fray and we're less likely to get into a fight or whatever it might be down the road. And the third is that when there is misconduct, when there is something um, uh, that happens, we're going to focus on holding somebody accountable and repairing damage that has been done to the community and to the person that might be harmed, and not necessarily just on a model that's punitive um, and focused on holding somebody um, quote unquote um, responsible. This is a graphic that I'll just talk through really quickly that I think kind of it nicely um, compares the two paths a restorative justice school and a zero tolerance school. So in a restorative justice school, a kid comes to school, he's welcomed by his classmates, he's welcomed potentially by a social worker. In a zero tolerance school, more likely to be welcomed by a mental defector, potentially a school resource officer. In a restorative practices school, if that kid's late to class, the, the, the teacher might hold off, talk to him after class, talk to him with the social worker, find out what's going on. In a more zero tolerance school, he's more likely to get called out in class and automatically get a detention. Um, if there is a fight in school, there's probably going to be a suspension or a more serious um, punishment that in a zero tolerance school. In a restorative justice school, um, they're going to focus more on getting the victim and the offender together, having a conversation, talking with other people in the class, um, potentially bringing a social worker in, and finding out what some of the um, uh, problems are and working to repair those broken bonds. What we found out is that when we kind of shift the paradigm um, onto more restorative models in our schools, we get some pretty positive results. So certainly, not surprisingly, we get some positive results when it comes to suspensions. And um, this is simply a slide that lays out suspension rates um, that dropped dramatically when Denver Public Schools adopted restorative practices in their, um, uh, in their school system. We also see a significant decrease in the racial disparity of punishments in schools when we adopt these practices. There's other evidence, not quite as strong, but other evidence um, that everybody in the school has a stronger learning experience and that people that are maybe on the wrong end of harm being done, um, they also have a more positive experience and feel like they're able to grow and move on uh, after, um, after this happens. Now, in addition to the educational context, the last thing I want to touch on is how we can use restorative justice in the juvenile justice context. How can we get over that mindset that I talked about at the very beginning, where it is just the state against a, um, an individual or a child who is violating the law, and work to get to a more community-based um, harm repairing um, uh, paradigm and um, uh, uh, system. So a couple principles that are important for the restorative justice process in the criminal context. The first is that crime is a violation of people and relationships. We are all a community. And I know it's a big theme tonight. We are all a community. And when somebody harms somebody else, um, everybody it, it, to some extent is harmed. Those community bonds are frayed. Victims in the community are central to the justice process. It is not just about the state against um, an individual who's done wrong. The victims need to play, or should play under this model, um, when they want it, a central role in the process. A primary focus of the justice process is to assist victims and address needs. A secondary focus is to restore the community to the degree possible. And the last one, and this is really important, it kind of gets blurred here because I, I messed up the spacing, but all human beings have dignity and worth. One of the things that people often ask me um, as a criminal defense attorney is, you know, how do you defend some of those guys, right? You know, there's some... You know, there's, there's some people that have been accused of and have done some bad things. How do you defend those guys? Um, and one of the things that has always stuck with me that somebody told me when I was a young public defender is that nobody would want to be defined by the worst thing that they've done. And that is something that has really stuck with me. I know I don't want to be defined um, by the worst thing that I've done. And even people that have done really bad things, um, they remain to be, they remain human beings who have dignity and worth, and we should respect that, um, while also um, focusing on accountability. Just to show you kind of the different shift in paradigm, under the traditional system, crime, our current system, crime is a violation of the law and the state, under the restorative system, a violation of uh, people and relationships. Under our traditional system, if you commit a crime, you are, you, that's guilt. Under a restorative system, it creates obligations to others to repair those uh, bonds that you frame. Criminal justice system, justice requires the state to remove blame and impose pain. Restorative system, justice involves victims, offenders, community members, um, and efforts to put things right. 
Under the criminal justice system, our offenders um, get what they deserve. That's the focus. Under our restorative justice system, the focus is to make sure that the victim, victim's needs and that the offender is helping, um, is being responsible for repairing those needs, for repairing those harms. A couple examples of ways that restorative justice principles have been uh, used effectively in our criminal justice system. Um, one is victim offender conferencing. So the idea uh, that um, instead of um, having a more adversarial system, if a victim is comfortable in participating in this, we'll get them in a conference with the offender. Um, we're seeing this increasingly around the country in the juvenile justice context, really trying to get some early intervention programs there. Um, strong evidence that that's not only beneficial to the offender, also really beneficial to the victim because they can hear um, and hopefully get a, a, a forthright apology, but also hear um, what was contributing to that behavior. Family group conferencing, similar idea, but really involving the whole community, involving the families of people who are involved. Sentencing circles, um, this is an idea where the community gets together instead of just a judge determining a sentence, the community gets together and really um, contributes and talks about and tries to determine what a healthy and fair sentence would be. And teen courts, which are something that we see here in some places in Northwest Indiana, um, where when somebody has done something um, against the rules in school, we'll have um, students come together and they'll kind of be judged by a jury of their peers. Um, again, hopefully determining a more appropriate sentence and forestalling or referral to the juvenile justice system. There are benefits um, to uh, these types of models in our criminal justice system when they've been adopted around our country and other countries. A few of these are listed here. We've seen reduced recidivism, reduced incarceration rates, of course, um, victim empowerment, closure, and satisfaction, reduced cost. It costs $30,000 to incarcerate somebody for a year in this country on average, reduced cost, um, and uh, stronger community bonds. Obviously, um, these principles aren't going to be appropriate in every case, but there are many cases um, when we have victims that are going to want to participate in this type of a process, um, and there are some really exciting models out there. We've started to see some implemented in Northwest Indiana and Lake County. There is a, a pilot program um, uh, to start to have some of these victim offender um, conferences. I'm excited about those. Um, I think that it's an idea, though, that we can all take back to our community, to our elected officials, to our leaders, um, to try and push for the, the adoption of these um, alternative ways about, of thinking about punishment um, and repairing harm that's been done. Thank you all very much. Thank you.